right, good stuff. Turned out good. It is great to see that many yellow shirts around the room. Very cool. Well, I want you to welcome both friends of and leaders of Light and Power, Jeff and Kathy McNair. And we said this last service that in our conversation about today, they would much rather prefer me just preach and do what I do, but I insisted I want to hear from them a little bit. So this is not their decision, uh, it's mine, uh, but I appreciate them complying. So I thought one thing that would be really neat um, for you to hear, I loved hearing a little bit of the backstory, even the name of Light and Power as a ministry to disabled adults, why that name? Give us a little bit of that context, Jeff. Well, first I want to say, we have such incredible support from Todd and the leadership here, so we're incredibly grateful for that. No, but Light and Power, uh, there's lots of kind of groups and ministries and whatever that are out there for people uh, that include people with disabilities, and they got like the goofiest names, like God's Special Angels Unaware or something like this, you know, and it's kind of like if you're in the community and you, somebody says, hey, you go to Trinity? Yeah, what are you in? Well, I'm into God's special angels unaware class. It's kind of like, what's that about? So we wanted to have a name, first of all, that'd be kind of cool. What are you in? I'm in a light and power class, baby. Power. All right. <laughs> That's right. But the idea behind that was kind of like <clears throat> the idea of being a light to the community, kind of punching holes in the darkness by being light. People with intellectual disabilities aren't the kind of people going to engage you in an intellectual argument to make a point, but they can be loving better than anybody, maybe. And so they can be light in the community. And then Todd mentioned earlier the notion of power uh, expressed in weakness. And people will look potentially on individuals' disabilities and think, you know, there's not a lot of power going on there. I mean, Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 12 says, you know, people that we think are less honorable, that we think are weaker. But in reality, in the passage uh, also that, Paul, uh, that Todd mentioned, um, God's power is made perfect in weakness. And so individuals with disabilities, they can be light in the community and they can they kind of express the power of God. That's awesome. Well, tell us a little bit, um, just in general, how long you guys have been providing leadership with Light and Power? Yeah, this year is actually the 25th anniversary of this class. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so it started just with maybe five or six people and now most Sundays we have between 60 and 70 that meet together to learn about Jesus. So it's a great class. That's good. Well, you have the mic, Kathy. Tell us a little bit, maybe just about you guys, okay. how long you've been married, kids, stuff like that about your okay. family. We have two adult um, children. Our daughter is married and lives in Seattle, and our son is married and lives in Riverside. So that's really fun to be able to have lots of special time with them. And I have been, the last couple of years, a switch in my career. I went back into the classroom, and this year I'm teaching at Redlands High School in a class with 18 to 22 year old students with moderate to severe disabilities. So we have a blast in there. And I also teach part-time at Cal Baptist. And I'm a professor at Cal Baptist um, teaching mod severe disabilities, disability studies. And I also work part-time for the Johnny and Friends organization. Some of you guys might have heard of Johnny Erickson Tata, so I work with them. That's great. And you said last service been married 40 years this oh, yeah, spring. 40 years. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Of course, we were married when we were 15, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff's like, that's still not good, yeah. <laughs> well, let's do this. I wanted you guys to get to share a couple uh, just, uh, just unique memories, times that just really stick out to you. There, there are obviously over 25 years or so many, but just give us a couple snapshots that have been meaningful for you. Yeah, one that's really amazing is that, once again, you look on a person with some form of a disability and you think that maybe they're not able to do things, but I find that oftentimes that's not a reflection of them, that's a reflection of me in my expectations. And so one of the things that we discovered in Light and Power was that I would ask people to pray. You know, would you say a prayer for whatever? And people would be always like, nah, I don't want to pray. And I was kind of like, what's that about? How come you don't want to pray? And, and then the, kind of the light came on for me that, you know, you hear people like Todd or Kathy or myself or whomever praying and they're saying, you know, Lord Jesus, we're thankful for the gift of your son. And, the, you know, this kind of, a, kind of expansive prayer with this big language. And then I say, well, you do that. And nope, I'm not going to do that, right? And so the, one of the things that we did is we taught a simple prayer. And the simple prayer was help me, right? Perfect prayer. Or help Todd or whatever it would be, right? 
And um, then we found we had a lot more kind of prayer warriors all of a sudden because people were able to do that prayer. But one of the coolest stories is I travel a lot, and before I travel, I'll say to the group, you know, hey, would you say a prayer for me as I'm traveling? And they all say, yeah. Well, afterwards, one day, this one gal, <clears throat> kind of a severely disabled gal, she comes up to me and she goes, I pray you, Jeff. And I said, oh, thank you very much. She goes, no, I pray you now. I said, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and so I kind of sat down in front of her and she put her hand on my head and she just said, help Jeff, help Jeff, help Jeff, amen. And sometimes when she'd pray like this, she would even weep, help Jeff. And I just thought, what an incredible ministry this woman has now because I helped her to have the opportunity to express her gifting. Her, she was not doing it in the past because I hadn't helped her to express what was there. Um, there's so many wonderful stories. The one I'm thinking about right now is I've had a few phone calls over the years from people um, in Light and Power, and they've actually asked me, Kathy, what does it mean to be busy? Why does everybody say they're busy? And when you think of someone maybe who has a job for a couple hours or goes to a day program and then goes back to their apartment and it's noon, and now they got to fill their hours till 10 o'clock at night, and you know they call someone, hey, can I come over and wash your car? No, I'm too busy to come get you. Well, like they don't understand what that whole busy Thing means and so that was a huge wake-up call to me that you know I'm filling my life with all of these lists of things to do and yet there's people who would love to help me do those kinds of things or would enjoy um, being beside me when I'm doing them or have me call and tell what's going on in my life and the things that are going on so besides that too it's interesting to see people um, with intellectual disabilities that don't have a lot of stress in their life because they're just worried about getting to work and back or worried about um, calling their mother that day. And we'll talk about like some huge crisis in the United States and people will be very sad about it in class. And um, Jeff, will be, Jeff will say, or somebody will say like, you know, do you ever ask yourself like, what are we doing here in this earth? Like, why can't we just go to heaven? Like, all these terrible things are happening and there's always a murmur in the class and it's like, you mean you don't know what we're doing here? Jeff, we're here because we're supposed to tell about Jesus. Yeah, Jeff, what you, you don't know what we're doing here? <laughs> and so it's just, it really like puts the faith in action that, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be telling people about Jesus. We intellectualize it so much. So that that's a really um, was a wake-up call to me, too. That's awesome. So, you guys, one thing that we'll, we're going to talk about today related to Light and Power relates to friendship. And so, Jeff, t if, if someone was here today and they would say, they might even be yet wearing a yellow shirt, and the, the relationship, though, is minimal at best, and, and some of us might just not have any kind of relationship or friendship at all with someone who has a disability, where would be the place to start? Like, where do you, where do you begin that? Yeah. Just to pick, piggyback on what Kathy said, Kat, I mean, we've done a lot of work internationally, I'll never forget when I was in the Ukraine, and there was a pastor who said, people with disabilities are millionaires of time. Think about that. Millionaires of time. And so there's a lot of time just because of the social consequence of disability where people are socially isolated and they're by themselves and whatever. So, I mean, you hear something like this and it's kind of like, oh, they expect me to do all these incredible things and spend all this time. No, man, it's just a, it's a minimal thing. I mean, it's the calling somebody on the phone. How was your week? You know, it's receiving a call from them. It's seeing somebody outside and buying them a cup of coffee or a donut. I promise you, if you ask somebody if they want a donut, they will say yes, <laughs> Inclu including me. So uh, <laughs> no, no shame in that. Um, and, it does, and, and it's interesting that even a small thing makes a huge difference. My buddy Mark over here. Mark, put your hand up, my friend. My buddy Mark. Mark and my son Josh are good buddies. And particularly when Josh was living at home, Josh just hasn't lived home in a long time. But Josh and Mark would go out to lunch maybe once a month at best, and they'd go to Chipotle, right? Well, 90% of Mark's conversation at that time was about his friend Josh and how, man, we're the Chipotle buddies, and we go out to Chipotle all the time and like this based on one lunch per month. So the power that you have to do incredible good just by inviting someone to simple friendship is just uh, amazing. Darn right. <laughs> That's great. Can you give Jeff and Kathy a hand? Thank you, guys.
Well, we are excited today. We're going to spend some time looking at God's Word, and that's what we want to do. We want to keep framing our lives. We want to keep seeing life through the lens of what the Bible has to say, and you'll see that everything we've talked about today definitely is the heart of God, and we're really excited that you're here today. If you have a Bible, would you find your way to Matthew chapter 22? Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Find your way there. We'll be looking there in just a moment. Also, if you have your Trinity this week, you'll notice a, a, a sheet that looks like this, this gray. If you want to get that out, that'll help you track with us as we walk through um, our time together. Our time is going to be a little bit short today because of our Serve Expo. That's where you don't applaud, by the way. Last week, I said, we're going to let you out early. Everyone's getting excited. That's a bummer. Why do you mean less church, you know? So don't do that. That hurts my feelings. But we are, we are going to keep it. Yeah, exactly. We're going to keep it short today. And I uh, want to give you some time to get out there. As you're finding your way there, I want to remind you that this time, or well, not this time, but next Sunday on the 19th, we have a lot of just great milestone anniversaries this month of August. It is Steve and Diane's 30th year serving at Trinity. So we're going to have a great celebration Sunday afternoon, the 19th from 3 to 5 in the afternoon. So please join us. All are welcome. It's going to be right here in the worship center. It's going to be a great time getting to celebrate what God's done in and through them. So it'll be great. Well, like we said, this month is um, a real focus, where you fit at Trinity. Our whole goal is to help you because as we see scripture, we would see that two very important ways, very clear directives in scripture are to be involved with the local group of believers, primarily, not only, but primarily through the lens of being involved in using, putting your gifts to use, as well as joining a small group. These first two weeks of August have been focused on finding a place to serve, and then the next two weeks, next week and the last week, will be about finding a group to belong to. So we're really excited about that, and, and we're doing that because we really believe the Bible teaches with great clarity. One of the things we mentioned last week is we talked about the idea that some of us would say, you know, Todd, I don't know if I have much to offer. I don't know if I'm, I'm gifted to, to serve in many ways, and we would just say the Bible says different. The Bible says that, no, you are gifted you, because you're a follower of Jesus. Part of the thing that God has done in you is he's designed you, he's equipped you, he's built you to serve. So the, the question that every Christian should be asking related to serving in a local church is not a question of if I should be serving, but simply where. Where should that serving be taking place? And so that's what we're trying to do. That's what our Serve Expo is all about. We'll tell you a little bit more about the opportunities out there uh, by the time we're done today. Here's our now what statement. Where are we going today? What's the whole point? It's in your notes and on the screen. When you love people like Jesus did, you value and serve everyone because they're loved by God. And that's what I love today. We're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew and just see the simple example in the words of Jesus and how that fuels the way that we ought to be living. Um, when we think of Jesus' three plus years on the planet, you know, we don't have every encounter. John actually says at the end of his gospel, he says that if, if all the things that Jesus didn't said would be written down, we, we, a room couldn't contain them, like a library would be full. So we know that the gospels were rightly so, they were selective. So these four books that give chronicle, give understanding to the life and the ministry and even who the character uh, of Jesus is, the identity is all contained initially in these first books of the New Testament. And so when we see them, what we see across the board of these Gospels is we see some very intentional accounts of who Jesus spent time with. And it's interesting to note, if you think about these groups for a minute, a little bit, you're going to actually have to kind of pause because then you're going to ask the question, would I spend time with people like this? Number one, he spent time with people who were tax collectors and prostitutes, who even the culture would say an assorted group of sinners, and nobody in Jesus' day from the people of Israel would spend time with this unsavory crowd. Jesus was actually consistently criticized because he did. Another group that Jesus spent time with went out of his way to go to places like Samaria, the foreigner, the alien, not alien from another planet, alien from another place. And the people of Israel would not spend time with those who were not to the ethnical bar. I think I just made a word ethnical. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> ethnic bar of their own blood heritage, but Jesus went out of his way to interact with and value people from other places. Jesus gave great value to women. Women were far below what we'd even call second-class citizens. They were at the bottom of the bottom. 
And Jesus' interactions with them always demonstrated a sense of dignity and value and worth. Jesus also spent time with people who were disabled. To name a few that we see in scripture, people who were blind, the paraplegic, the deaf, just to name a few. And Jesus gave them time. Jesus gave them the ability to come towards him. Even though the crowds were great, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops the crowds and makes way for a man to be healed. And that's what we often see is that when people came to Jesus out of faith saying, would you heal me? He did. There's just a cross section of the type of people that Jesus made time for intentionally sought out was someone who strategically said, I want to spend time with you. That begs a great question. Are we living out the example of Jesus? In your notes, I guess you could say that Jesus was a great friend. Jesus was a great friend to whomever came across his path because he embodied the kind of love that God has for everyone. You see, Jesus is God. One of the triune members of the Trinity. And so Jesus simply, this is what we love when we even sing in, at Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us. That's what the words mean. We say that Jesus brings the incarnation in the flesh form of God. So we can see how would God act if he was one of us because he was. And as we read the gospel accounts, we're reading about a Jesus who intentionally seeks people out from all different parts and paths of life. Because why? God made every single individual in his image, out of his design, and with his sovereign plan. That is powerful to stop and think about, the image bearerness of God. There is much in our culture today that talks about the value of a lot of other beings, whether it be animals or the environment, and we are to shepherd, to steward well what God has given us. But when we read the account of God breathing into life creation, we see that at the apex, at the highest point of creation, he doesn't just create another being, he creates man and woman, how? In our image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. There is a uniqueness about a human being above all else in creation. Nothing else in creation is ever given that kind of moniker, given that kind of description the fact of people and people alone. So, so what we're boiling it down to is this, Jesus, not only in the way he acted, but in what he talked about. At a time, we've looked at this passage many times just in my two years here. In Matthew 22, the place where you're at, people are trying to pin him down, make him make a mistake in what he would say. So they say, Jesus, of the 600 plus commands that God gives us in, the, in what, was, what we would call the Old Testament, which out of the 600 plus, which is the most important? Which is the greatest commandment? Without even flinching, without even needing to think, Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment, but it doesn't stop. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All, watch this, all of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So when Jesus, so they're trying to back him into a corner, Jesus is never backed into a corner. Jesus never flinches. Jesus never sweats. What am I going to say? Jesus simply says the truth. Love God with everything you have. And watch this. And love what he loves most. This is what we would call the great commandment. We talk about it often at Trinity Church. And the reason why we do if there's anything I'm ever guilty of that we as a church are ever guilty of is talking too much about the great commandment and the great commission, I'll say praise God. That's the kind of criticism I want. Because when Jesus said, these things matter most, love God and love what he loves most, and later on in Matthew 28, make disciples of all the nations, if he says, these things matter most in this big book I've given you of truth, then we ought to rally our lives, we ought to center our lives around these truths to start there before we go anywhere else. So this was the character of Jesus, but we've already seen that by the way that he interacted, but also by his words. He says, and he understood that because people were made in the image of God, they're worthy of us loving them and caring for them. So what we're gonna to do today, here we are in the second week of this month of Where You Fit at Trinity, the second week of our Serve Expo. And, and, and how does this all flesh out? What does this all look like? 
We'll do this. Your, your Bible's open to Matthew 22. I want to take you one more place and show you where one of Jesus' followers flesh this out at another level for us today, in another way. In 1 Peter. 1 Peter's in the back of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 4, if you want to make your way there. And I want you to see today that it really does boil down to loving God and loving people the way God loves them. That is the essence of what this whole thing about living a life following Jesus' example boils down to. First Peter chapter 4, look at verse 8. This is the way he put it. He said, above all, love each other deeply because love, love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In this set of three verses, three just big ideas come out. I, won't, I don't have much time today, but I want to briefly walk you through each of them. The first one that Peter begins with is love, other, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply, and I love even that adverb is on there about deeply, that there's a sense of, of the struggle of what does it mean to love and how much to love. It says love them and love them deeply, and this is the word he uses for love. In our, in our, we'll talk more about this in future weeks, but in our English language, the word love is a category we use for so many things. The original Greek language that the New Testament was written in had multiple words to convey love. So when we say love, we mean this kind of love. For instance, the kind of love you would have for people that maybe were in your family or just a really close, strong bond would be a, a phileo, a Philadelphia type of love. That kind of connection, and it just made sense that you would have that kind of familial uh, relationship with someone. Another love might be reserved more for within like a marriage, the sexual union, that kind of love was another type of word. And there are multiple words, but the interesting thing is the word that we see over most of the New Testament describing love was a word that was barely used outside of the New Testament. Meaning the Greeks would rarely ever refer to, it didn't even have a category for the type of love that New Testament authors those writing the Gospels and Paul writing letters, Peter writing letters, John writing letters, the, the word they most often used to describe love was the word agape. That word agape was almost unknown outside of the Bible. So you're like, you have to scratch your head. Did other people not understand what love was in the culture? And this kind of love, they didn't. Look at the word, it's in your, in your notes on the screen. Agape, the kind of love that God loves us with, is simply described as to prefer one another over yourself to prefer one another over yourself. Meaning that the Greek culture, the kind of love that they were used to showing was a love that would be based on what someone could do for you. This word inherently means comparison. Here am I, and to love you means to put you ahead of myself. It's a comparative term. So to demonstrate love has, in this case, very little to do with how I feel about you has very little to do with what you've done, has nothing to do with what you've done for me. It's all about I'm preferring you, putting you ahead of myself. That's biblical love for people, agape kind of love. And so we see this, and this is the kind of, of statement that, um, that Peter is using, love each other, prefer each other ahead of yourselves. That's huge, that clarifies so much right out of the beginning. But then he says, and do it, do it deeply. So this is not talking about patronizing relationships and friendships. This isn't talking about the surface. That, that if I'm honest, if I look at a lot of my relationships and friendships, that's really true of so many of us. We have friendships and relationships that so much to stay on top. They're very surface in nature. Peter says, love one another deeply. Roots that go deep. And why? Is it just because, but look at the last part of what, he, or the next part of what he says, because love covers a multitude of sins. I'll never forget, um, my wife and I, when we were young in ministry as youth pastors up in Oregon, I remember uh, going to a conference that our denomination put on. And we'd gone to this conference before, and real honestly, it was just so boring. You just kind of just wake me up when it's over, you know, kind of thing. And, I, and maybe I had a bad attitude, but it's just the truth. So we go to this conference, and I expected it to be like the others. But I'm telling you, we had a new president, and it was amazing. 
and all throughout. And then he had this guest speaker come and share. And, and basically what he shared was the, the cycle of friendships, the cycle of relationships. And he talked about what happens, if you could imagine it like a curve, what basically happens is, is that any time that you begin a friendship, begin a relationship with someone, whether it be as a friend, dating, whatever it might be, there, there's development, there's a trajectory that you're excited. This is a, a neat person. I love this about them. I enjoy this about them, whatever it might be. But you'll come to a a point of conflict and you'll come to a point in that trajectory there becomes a challenge and, and even what Peter says because we hurt each other we injure each other we sin against each other and how often in the trajectory of a friendship whenever that point of conflict comes whenever that time of injury comes we check out and I remember listening to this guy talk, and I just kind of pulled away, and I was thinking about different friendships over the course of my life. And I thought about for many, not all, but for many of them, yeah, that point of conflict came, that point when they sinned against me, and I just said, I'm over this. I'm not going to keep investing. I'm not going to keep trying to repair this. I just don't want any more. And we just became aloof, at best, very superficial. Peter says... That we're called to love each other deeply. We need that deep-rooted love towards one another because it's inevitable that conflict is going to come. It's inevitable that I'm going to injure you and you're going to injure me. Will we have the kind of love that can continue forward rather than just throwing up our hands and saying, I'm out? That's what Peter encourages us to have. Have that kind of love because you're going to need it. That's what it is to live in community with each other. The next phrase, we're not just to love those that we've talked about, those that we have a connection to, a already previous relationship. We're to love those that we don't even know well yet, those that we're not connected to. We're to offer hospitality. And that word, offer hospitality to strangers, literally breaks down as simply love strangers. Love people you don't know well yet. Build that bridge, step out. And I love that we're talking today, not just about our Serve Expo, but especially about taking some steps to build some friendships with people that you might not already know. That's huge, and it's a beautiful idea, and it comes really clearly out of Scripture. In doing so, we extend that kind of love and, and, and uh, kindness towards people we don't know, and what begins to happen is there begins to be people who are in the category of stranger who are now friend. What a great attitude, what a visual I could see in my mind as I walk through life and I have categories of people. What about if it kind of all boiled down to two categories? Someone that I'm not familiar with yet and someone who's my friend. And wouldn't it be that goal of saying, God, I want to keep moving people from here to here. I want to keep moving people from, I don't know you well, we're kind of disconnected, you're a stranger to me. I want to keep moving you into this category of going, now there's someone that I know, someone that I have a, a built a bridge with, I have a friendship with. Offer hospitality. Be someone who loves people that you don't even know yet. And do it with a cheerful heart, not with a complaining or secret displeasure is the way that word is defined. That's a powerful word. How many times have you done something for someone and then the minute that you have an opportunity to talk to someone else about it, you kind of rump, 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 gripe. Okay? That's what Peter's saying. Do it cheerfully, not with the griping that comes afterwards. And third, use whatever gift you've received. I love that word. It's, remember, we keep reinforcing that in this series. You've the, use the gift you've received. The word gift and the word grace go together. They're the same word in the Greek language. And so we can never take a hold and, and take some sort of credit for the way God has gifted us. We would never say, God, it's so great how I stepped into these roles or how I grew in this or how I become X because you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. God, you are the one who has given me spiritual gifts so that I might be able to serve others. That's the whole purpose. So we recognize they emanate from God, and we recognize that they're things that we thank him for. But watch this. We also recognize they're for the purpose of putting into use to serve others. In your Trinity this week, you have two other inserts besides our notes I wanted you to pull out. Take a look at these real quick. The first one is great. This, we realized in our communications team that we had an outdated version of just an overview of what Light and Power is. And so we put together this is brand new. Uh, Mindy, others in our communications team did such a great job. Kathy had a lot of content. But if you open it up, you'll see the front, Light and Power, a ministry including adults with disabilities. And you'll see some really good overview stuff when you open it up on the left panel. But I want to draw your attention to the right panel. 
Because here's the thing. I've gotten to know Jeff and Kathy for these last two years, and every conversation we've had keeps coming back to the same thing. As we think about a Serve Expo today, I would be remiss if the impression I gave you related to Light and Power is that Light and Power as a class, what Jeff and Kathy are looking for are more people to help on Sunday mornings. That's not their heartbeat. There are great people who already help and great people who will be called to help, but here's their heartbeat. Their heartbeat is that you would develop a friendship. Their heartbeat is that you would reach out and you would be a person who says, you know what, I want to get to know you. And what's great is they've given you a bunch of prompts. Look at the top. Light and Power class members would enjoy you, and there's some things there to, to drive them as they do grocery shopping, to invite them over, to help them with doctor's appointments. We already mentioned the great donut ministry that we can have. I love that. I want to do that. And I might buy two so we can have a conversation while we're both eating. Uh, take a walk for us. Or take a walk with us. Um, asking how we can pray. Teaching a craft. But watch this. This is what I loved about this brochure. It's not just ways or prompts for how you can build a bridge and become a friend. Look at the bottom. Light and Power class members would like to be your friend, be your prayer partner, stuff envelopes at your business, pick up trash in the community with you, have lunch together. These are all ways that as they've brainstormed and, and had conversations over the years, hey, we don't expect a one-way trip that you would simply invest in us. How could we serve you? How could we be a friend back? Because we know the best friendships are always two-way streets. What, what an incredible gift to have right in front of you in type prompts of how you can get to know people. Now, you might say, well, Todd, that's really great, and I appreciate that, and that's very helpful, but... but it, but I don't know where to start. Like, where, where, how, who? Like, literally, who? Who would I talk to and how would I build that bridge? Look at the other flyer in your notes. I love that this idea came up. And you'll notice as you get this out, on the top of mind is my good friend, Ray. Ray, where are you sitting? Ray and I were talking before today. Where's Ray at? There's Ray. There you are, right in the front, Ray. So Ray's picture and a little bio about Ray is right at the top of mind. But you're looking at yours and going, I don't see Ray. That's because you have one of four that are printed all throughout our different Trinity this week. So meaning, look at the one with the, your neighbor sitting next to you right now. You'll notice you probably have two different versions. There are a total of eight different names and bios on each one of these sheets, which means there's about 32 different, ver or different names and faces that you can get to know. I've gotten to know Ray and Tammy over the last two years, and so as I read this, if I didn't know Ray, and I got to read a little bio about him and understand about how he lives on his own and how he likes to, to work on cars. Then, and you know me in cars, right? This is a great way I can get some help. So my point is, is that that's, that's how this begins, is not just theory and not just a sequence of ideas, but actually names and faces where I can go first. Where I can go, now I have a name, now I have a face, I have a little bit of understanding. I didn't know you worked there. The next time I'm there, I'm going to be sure to look for you. I didn't know that you enjoyed this hobby or this pastime. I'm going to be sure to do, because I love that too. Let's do something together. We're, we're doing everything we can, providing information so you can build a bridge and you can actually do what we really believe is the heart of God, love your neighbor. Now, as you think about all this and you think about this idea of gifts and putting them into motion, notice as well the final phrase of this passage as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I want you to look at this in your notes. In your notes, both the diversity of our gifts as well as the directive. The directive, the command to put them into use as faithful stewards of what God has given to you are clearly communicated in scripture. Here's what I want you to know. That word stewardship is a powerful word because what it means is you don't own it. It's something that's been given to you for a purpose. We would say the same words related to your financial resources. That we often think we own what is in our bank account, but we don't. As believers, we're stewards of what God has given us. Or we might talk to you today as a parent about your children. Your children you've received as a gift for the purpose of preparing them to launch them back into their world with God's purposes to live out. That is a stewardship relationship. So in the same way I could talk about your role as parenting, the same way I could talk about your financial resources, the same way I talk about your gifts. Your gifts, the way God has designed you, built you to serve, is a stewardship for the purpose of being put into motion. A stewardship for the purpose of being able to use and serve other people in their lives. 
Take a look at this, this slide. This is the sheet that we included last week in your notes. We had too many uh, inserts this week, so we just want to put it on the screen. But here's a reminder again of all of the different ways at this present time, but, and we, that list is always changing, of roles in which you can find a place to serve. And as you look over that list, I want to just remind you of just three big ideas as we close. Number one, when you serve, remember that's the whole point of this, when you serve, other people are blessed. Other people that you come in contact, that you get to engage with and help, other people are blessed when you put your gifts into motion. Number two, another huge thing that we often don't think of until we get into it, is you realize a deep sense of purpose. God has built you with purpose, with intent, and when you begin to serve according to your gifts, you realize, God, this is one of the reasons you put me on the planet. You've actually given me the ability to contribute, to help. And it gives you just a great sense of understanding why God made you the way he did. But thirdly, I want to say this like we echoed last week. If you're new to Trinity, if this is a new phase for you, a new season, maybe you've come since January, and we really, we would say as a church, we really haven't given you enough on-ramps to get plugged in, but this month, this month is the time. And I would just say to you, this is where things change. Trinity becomes less of a service to attend and more of a family to contribute to. That's the change. That's the place I believe God wants every single person who's following Jesus is to move from attending a service to finding a place to contribute as part of this family. And that's what this month is about. Like we said, we're gonna let you go this morning a little bit early. Our hope is that you would go out to the expo. Some of you found some information, had some conversations, but you needed a week to pray about it. This is the week. Take, take use of that, and then we're gonna have a great day. If you have kids in our programs, I'm gonna ask that you let them stay there till about 1045, so we can pick them up all at once rather than in different segments. Let me pray, we'll let you go. Father God, we want to say thank you for today. Thank you for the great, rich opportunity to celebrate what you've done through the ministry of light and power, but also, God, to celebrate the opportunities that you have afforded us as a group of local believers at Trinity Church to serve you. And I pray that we would take that stewardship seriously. I pray we would take that step of saying, God, we want to be a people who put our gifts to use. We love you. Thank you for the, the fact that you would even call us into something like serving that we could contribute is powerful just to think about. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer this morning, we have folks down front who would love to pray for you. Otherwise, have a great time at the expo. We'll see you next Sunday.